I think I'll sort of start off by talking a little bit about the work that's over here, because in, in some ways it's actually in two parts, but it's all one piece of work together as well. But the pictures that we've got over on the side wall were actually taken in. If you've read all the text, you'll know, but if not, I'm going to go through it anyway. But it's, these pictures were taken in 1994 when I was still a student in my final year at Napier um, studying photography. And it was part of a larger series of work at the time, which was talking about identity and stigma. And I went to my sister, who is pictured at the top. And at the time she was living, um, she was a single parent. She was living in the rat block in Stirling. And um, I asked her if I could photograph her life because I was aware of the stigma that she lived in with her type of lifestyle, not as being a single parent, basically. And I wanted to show that her family life was the same as everybody else's family life, in some ways perhaps better, but that's probably because it was a personal project. The whole project is probably about 20 photographs, so this is a very, very small part of that that's up here at the moment. In a way, what it's doing, it's leading in to the sort of series that's behind us. Um, so I basically photographed them, photographed their lives. My sister didn't want to be photographed, so that's why she's at the top here and she's got a picture of her children in front of her face because for her, family was everything. So that's why she's been photographed in that way. And the rest of the pictures are just the children that are in them. At the end, I think the series is really about childhood, childhood worlds. And a lot of my other work is also, as I photograph a lot of children still. Um, I don't photograph in a real documentary way. Uh, this was, for me, the last type of what I would call a real documentary piece that I did back in 1994. And after that, my work kind of changed quite a lot. And I kept on doing environmental portraiture, as I called it, which is really when I went in to do documentaries, I was more interested in collaborating with people to actually photograph them. So I went back, I don't know, 2015, I started thinking about it. I'd been thinking about it off and on quite a lot, that I wanted to update their lives, see where their lives had taken them in the intervening years. Um, in some ways, I was a tiny bit reticent about doing it because um, I knew that life hadn't turned out perhaps the best and I'm very aware of that responsibility of going into situations and making sure that I um, represent people in a, in a respectful manner. And this is also my family, so it's, it's you know, an addict, not a burden, but I'm extremely aware of how I'm photographing people. I think I'll just show you who's who in case you haven't sort of made the connection with them. So my sister died in 2008, so she's not been pictured in the, in the photographs. But this, this child down here, Stephen, is this man up here. Um, the child here, Kelly. So these are all my nieces and nephews. This is her up here. And Chick at the bo bottom right is the one at the very end here. So Stephen, this is his three children that he has now. Kelly, this is her three children. And Chick, that's her daughter at the bottom. So what I try to do, sort of showing the work, is trying to give a sort of feeling about what's came from here and arrived at over here a little bit, but also then doing a grid of images to sort of tell a story about where their lives have taken them. Um, also did the newspaper in a way to sort of give more of the story. So when I was working through it, I mean, I started back in 2015 with this work, talking to them about it. I took it very, very slowly. And in a sense, it was about my own reconnection, I guess, because after my sister died, my own connection was getting less and less. I wasn't seeing them very much, because um, I would see my sister a lot, but as you know, our lives were getting on, I didn't actually see them that much. And I thought that was kind of wrong, basically. Photography, I go into people's lives and I photograph a lot. So I get into different people's lives and I talk to them. So this, I was using photography in that way again. But it's with my own family to make that reconnection. I want you to read a tiny little bit about this photograph because it shows you how personal a project it was. But at the same time, it's trying to give an overview of a circumstance in people's lives. So it's very brief. <laughs> Stephen took me for a walk on the day of his portrait. He said he knew a nice place just up the road. We walked then stopped in an area of open land 
and I realised quite suddenly this is where his mum, my sister, had lived before she died. Stephen had lived there with his mum. Nothing left here, he said. We took a few photos and walked on. So I think when I put the, the sort of newsprint together, I try to bring that personal aspect into it even more, that this is not just their story, it's partly, it's actually my story as well. So I did environmental portraits. Um, we looked at all the old work together on iPad, looked through it all. I said, do you, how do you feel about me doing this again, coming back, doing a new story? And they, were all, they all wanted to do it. Um, I talk about collaboration, how I sort of work with people when I'm doing natural pictures. Um, I don't just sort of go in there and say, okay, stand there, do this, do that. A lot of these uh, portraits are actually observed, things that are happening. I'm hanging about, things happen, and then I say, okay, let's try, let's try and do a portrait. Um, not all the time. I do actually construct quite seriously my pictures. But, you know, other times, like for this, Stephen said to me, let's go to different places. And I went to those different places with him. Um, this isn't the, the one that I just read about, but we actually photographed during that time that place as well. <coughs> a lot of people think that this is about seven in the morning, that I get up at seven in the morning, which I do not. And it's a, it was a really strange day, and it was about one o'clock in the afternoon um, when I went to photograph him. It was just this really, really heavy fog, mist, I don't even know. I'm not even sure. It was, it was a crazy weather that day when I photographed it. I'm still getting to know my extended family from doing this project. This is an ongoing project for me. I'm going up again soon again, and I'm sort of bringing in different ways that I work with them, which is I work a lot in collaboration with community-based projects, and I'm taking those kind of ideas and taking it into this project now to see how handing over cameras to the people that I've been photographing is actually going to maybe change the project as well. So I don't see this as finished. I see it as ongoing. Um, the pictures here, I guess more, some of them more observational, um, sort of portraits, some face, some of them, but I guess it's just sort of a mixture. Um, if you look at the paper, you, you'll get some kind of text which sometimes goes with the pictures. Um, with this one here, uh, this is Stephen and he was given a homeless flat. He doesn't live with his children. Um, all these things I'm telling you, I've approved with them to actually tell you because I think this is a really big question in this type of photography is that you're not exploiting people and that you're being res respectful. And that, I mean, I could tell you lots of stories about this and I'm only telling you one story per that they've allowed me to tell you, basically. So this, in his, uh, this situation here, he's moved into a, a flat, which is a homeless flat, and they told me I think, something that I didn't know, which is when you move in, it's the same couch, it's the same curtains, it's the same uh, carpet, everything's the same. And everybody knows when they visit you that this is a homeless accommodation, and it's a bit of a mark of shame for some reason. And so his sister gave him all these little, little bits and bobs to make it more like a home. And in the background, she's given him photographs of his nieces and nephews as well. So that's what's in this picture, is his family. It's not his children, it's the rest of the family. So I think the whole thing about this coming from over on the bottom bit is the, that experience of family and how important it is, and it is binding them all together, even though they have came from... Their circumstances are perhaps not the best. They've not had the easiest of times. Um, but there's also the question in there of if you grow up in that type of environment, how do you get out of that environment? Do you actually want to get out of that environment? And I think if you read some of the paper, you'll see that some people say, I am perfectly happy here, I want to be here. And I think you have to, uh, that's a story that has to be heard as well, because sometimes people look at the, like pictures of flats like this and say, oh well, you know, this is terrible, people must want to leave. Actually, no people want to stay and there's very good reasons and it's about community as well so I think that's about me um, so my name is Tina um, and this is a project I've been working on for a couple of years now it started in 2013 um, when I went to Venice which 
I think the project's been on my mind for a while without actually knowing what was going on. And I think that's what you said in the beginning, Malcolm, about not maybe fitting into photojournalism or straight up conceptual or like being somewhere in between was something I always struggled with. And especially in art school, I, everyone always talked about, you need your big project. What's your project? What's it about? And I would just take pictures and be fascinated by a lot of different things. I would shoot so much. Um, but sometimes it, when you looked at it, it maybe didn't make any sense because it could be from a personal photo of my sister or of, I don't know, garbage on the floor. Like it could be anything. Um, but then I think going to Venice and being there for a couple of months kind of just made it all click in my head. And then I started seeking this kind of like style of photographing and looking for the specific materials and interiors that kind of told the story I wanted to tell. Um, and then in a year later, I started school again in my master's and that's where the project really started coming together and I, uh, with a teacher of mine, um, looked at all the photos and he, he just said, like, it's Baroque. I was like, what? Like, no, I'd never thought about that. You know, you just, you do something and you don't really know and he just, because he said that one word, then the book came. So before all the pictures on the wall, there's the book, which is still to be a proper book. So I only have one dummy left now, but it's here for you to look at and hopefully it'll be out sometime this year, I'm hoping. Um, but this was the start of it. I showed it once with a couple of pictures on the wall a couple of years ago as well, but nothing like this. So this is the first time it's like become an actual thing and like seeing prints on the wall, having installation. So that was really exciting and also building, having the possibility to like change the space, build a wall and like work with the installation. I think it was really important because of the, and you can see as well, you can have a look at the way the book is made. It's very like layers on layers and a lot of like reflections and materials that vary from like being really organic to being very, very artificial and fake. Um, and I kind of wanted to bring that to the, to the showcasing of it. And I don't know if we, sh it's not like a flow per se, it's kind of supposed to be an explosion, but organized explosion. Um, for me, it's a lot about, um, first of all, looking at the materials of wealth, like what does that mean? What kind of uh, fabrics and what kind of, what kind of nature do we think about when we think about wealth and overflow and like, um, yeah, something that's almost too much. Um, and then also when I reflect on it a bit more, it's about class and the division of the, the society, but on a very conceptual way. So I'm not talking about social issues per se, but I'm definitely trying to comment on a certain lifestyle. That's probably not normal anymore, but it's still something we see going down the street. You see the, the reminiscence of these, the architectural facts and the, when you go to museums and when you go to like certain monuments, you, you see this like the way of life that used to be like the standards of what you want it to be. And I just brought a little, little piece of text um, which is from Karen Blixen, which is a Danish writer who's been a big inspiration. And she talks a lot about like the class system and she's from a really wealthy family but ended up not having any money, having to write to make her own money. And yeah, so this is from like 1920 or something. But I just want to read something out really quickly. Um, talking about, um, indeed he says, physical well-being and comfort uh, were without actual significant for past ages. It was rank, precedence. It was dignity, majesty, uh, pump, rank, um, which were for them the life's greatest values. Grandi grandiosity, arrogance. We can perhaps gather all these concepts in the French word prestige, in order clearly, clearly to demonstrate they were superior human beings. Kings, princes, and cardinals had to spend their lives in superhuman surroundings. In order to preserve their own dignity, they had to form their existence like a series of processions and ballets. And for them, it was all worth the effort. The need for physical well-being and comfort was in their eyes a weakness which they owed it to themselves to overcome. I think that's really beautiful, this like, you're like, you're something bigger than yourself almost. And I think some of these aspects kind of prove that as well. Um, 
that it's not about having a healthy, natural life. It's about showing the world that you're closer to the gods than the people below you. And I think that's really scary and interesting. Um, and installation-wise, I used, for the first time, some, some mirror um, aspects here to kind of give you a different view of the actual image, because that's a lot about the whole um, installation as well, how once you see something in a mirror, I, maybe it's just me, but when I look here, I want to look in the mirror first. And you know, when you see a picture of something, sometimes, even if you have the object that's portrayed right next to you, you look at the picture first. I think that relationship between object and what's photographed is really interesting. Um, but on the other side, we go here, we have more human aspects, but still they're always, um, they're always portrayed from behind or from the side and you never get a face, but that's mainly to show that we're in a way a part of the whole installation. At least the people in the project, they're almost like the statues. Um, and in a way, the statues are more important than them because they will live forever. So it's also in a way about this like, yeah, who's closer to, to God, who will survive the longest and uh, what will stay when we're all gone, the materials, we use and have around us, what will that mean to future um, generations? And another aspect is this um, big picture in the installation, um, which is from Calvin Grow Art Gallery. And that was the last picture of the series when I finished it uh, a couple years ago. And it kind of I had most of the pictures, and it's about 150 pictures, the whole project, but something was just missing. So for some reason, I just went to Calvin Grove. I was like looking, I was like hunting. I was like, I know there's something missing, and I walked around, found this image, and used the flash to create this kind of reflection as well. And then I knew, okay, done, like that's it. And that could kind of wrap it up. But it's still ongoing, it's really hard to get to like let it go, so every time I see like a curve with a specific ornament, I'm like, ooh, or every time I go to a museum, I, yeah, continue it, but I'm trying to close it, move on. And this has kind of led me to my next project, which is about Europe, and like looking closer at, like taking a lot of these elements, but like investigating the idea of old Europe in architecture, in, yeah, interior design, and something that's gone, in a way. I think, that's it. Do you have any questions? My name is Sylvia, and then it gets difficult. Um, but I wanted to talk more about um, where the title of the work comes from, because I think it will kind of introduce you to the idea and where the idea comes from. Um, the title is Lethe, and Lethe is a river in ancient Greece, like when, the, when people die, the ancient Greeks believe that they go to kind of purgatory area, like a no transit zone, um, they, and to kind of like reincarnate they have to drink from this river of forgetfulness, so they don't remember who they were in a past life, and then they become a new life as a new beings and um, this uh, series is talking a, a lot about this um, kind of not um, dwelling in the past um, it started um, actually it's a kind of like a very personal reaction almost I would say like a therapy um, because I mean my husband is here so I hope he doesn't mind me filling you in about like a family history two years ago we had we were going for a really really hard time um, my mom-in-law was um, diagnosed with a brain tumor and we've been married for 15 years so i kind of knew my parents-in-law for many many years and it was a big shock to the family because in the circumstances like your whole personality changes and then matters moved really really swift so from kind of having a big family, um, like she was the kind of person, like a mother hen almost, uh, who gathered everyone around her. All of a sudden, um, she left us, and um, this was a big shock for my stepchildren, for the whole family. 
and the, the series is kind of like a reaction to it. Um, but it's also a kind of a thought so when I, I had the idea in the back of my head for a long time. It just needed, it's like a, a little bit like a kind of ulcer that needs bursting. And then this moment in your life comes and you say, ah, sod it. I'll do something completely different from what I usually do. Um, because I come from a graphic design background. And if you ever had anything to do with working with graphic designer or you, you are a graphic designer, you kind of know how controlling environment it is, like things being shifted two millimeters right way and two millimeters left way and endlessly dwelling. Is it perfect? And um, so I kind of wanted to let go a little bit. And then the idea came with the tearing of the bits of paper because the action kind of doesn't give you much control. You kind of have a print, you, talk, you go through it, and it's already, like, you, you can't stitch it back, so it's, so it's back seamless. I mean, obviously, you can print it again, but that's, that's not, not the whole point. So all the images that are used in these collages are the um, images that I had in my archive, because I've, I'm, I've been working as a photographer for last, uh, well, let's say 15 plus years. So I had this huge archive of things from previous projects. And also like when we were, because my, my father-in-law, he passed away soon after my mom-in-law. So we were left with this huge archive of family portraits. And then I realized that actually this printed matter, this paper, which is kind of very transitioned um, material, it's not durable at all. It's kind of, the only thing that remains after this, after this person because the image of them, the face kind of slowly fades back in our memory. So I kind of w wasn't comfortable with using the family archive images because I thought that that's not my life. I didn't know my parents-in-law before I met my husband. So I don't know, I don't have any recollection of them, of their life as a young people. I only knew them when they were in their seventies. So um, I used the picture, the lady in the back, that's, that's my mother-in-law, and she very kindly posed for my previous series. And, but I had all these images that were never used, uh, never used in, the, in, the, in the project, so I thought I'll, I'll reuse this. I'll look through the archive and reuse it. So lots of the people are people who I knew for a very long time, 15, 20 years. Some are new friends um, because I moved to Scotland eight years ago now. So it's also, um, this, the, the, this collages also talk a little bit of this, that I'm kind of like a, now a patchwork of person from different location because I speak in a foreign language. English is not my first language, as you probably have noticed. <laughs> Um, I have a surname that no one can pronounce or, I mean, it takes them a long time to see that YK kind of completely throws them off. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of like a different, different person who is like one leg in one culture and the other leg in the other culture. And for the very first time I started using the landscape because I mainly work in a studio in a quite controlled environment. And then I was traveling back and forth or um, doing some commissions in, a, let's say, north of Scotland. So this kind of confrontation with a Scottish landscape that it's so different from the Polish landscape was a big factor in, in, in using these images in, in here as well. So yeah, and that was kind of like very emotional response because it was the first idea where I kind of like let go and it's also what is shown in street level is um, these images are for the very first time shown actual in print because I kind of brought this specimen here so <laughs> you, can, uh, you can have a look how, uh, how it looks like. So they were, they were kind of like torn bits of paper on different layers and this was rephotographed. So the original images are even smaller, they're kind of like half of this. And um, the idea was that it's almost like a meditation that you're kind of reworking these bits of paper, you tear them, tear them in a different way, and then you reassemble them and you kind of, in a split second, decides, oh, is it resonating with me or is it not resonating with me? If it's not, then 
let's move and do something else. And it was the very first time I worked like this, because previously I had like people coming to the studio, um, shoots arranged three weeks ahead, uh, particular time of day because the light is working uh, best in this particular time of day. I was very restricted and this was for the first time when I kind of had a free reign. I had the images that I just wanted to use. I had like a pile of images and I was just tearing through them and then reassembling them and that's what's behind the work. And now I'm working on a continuation of the project, but it's going to be very different. I'm coming back full circle. I'm going to be controlling again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, that's how it Did works. Did you deassemble these after you? Oh, yeah, they, they, all these are loose pieces of paper. Yeah. So um, if I wanted to, I would kind of like, you know, it, I, I guess I could continue like assembling them and reassembling them endlessly. But at some point you have to stop. You kind of say, OK, that's enough, I'm healed, I can move on to something else. And I think that was the, the big role of this, of working on these collages, that it's um, kind of letting myself see that if I'm not contr super controlling, it can also work. So, yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you for uh, actually trying to bring the rain to come over here. Uh, I also want to take this chance to say all the thank you to the staff who work here at Shoot Level. Their support over the years for my photography has been excellent, so I want to say a big thank you to all the Shoot Level members of staff. Uh, in terms of an intro, uh, sort of intro to my work, uh, I've been interested in photography since I was a wee boy. My nana passed over me my first ever, ca my first ever camera, which was a Polaroid. I must have been eight, and this is back in the late 80s. And I was like, kind of like the Stephen Shore of uh, young boy photography. I was just taking photographs of my He Man uh, toys. But then later years, it started to develop. Uh, I started getting obsessed with the city of Glasgow when I was younger. I found the Highlands. I've been living in the Highlands. Well, I moved to Glasgow when I was 18. Uh, it's got a big step for me. But one of my first experiences living in Glasgow was an experience in the street. Uh, I was in, town with, in Glasgow town with my, uh, with my parents and they were walking past Boots and I was a vivid memory of this was there was a, a young lassie walking past us and she had a large handbag and a person grabbed the handbag off her and tried to steal it from her and she held onto his handbag and she left these footmarks on the street because she was holding on for so long eventually the guy got away with it I remember turning to my dad, who was like a six foot three, big Highland giant. I said to him, why is nobody stopping and helping? But I explained, my dad explained to me in subtle terms, you can say to an eight year old, he's like, you can't really help because you never know what could happen to you if you try and stop them. And that's always kept in my mind. So when I first moved to Glasgow, I noticed the difference between living in the Highlands and living in the city, where you live in the Highlands, you walk down the street and people acknowledge you and say hi, acknowledge you without even knowing them. So I, automatically I felt this kind of like isolation in the site centre and I think for the years it's prevailing further and further because of we're told to fear everybody, we're told to have this kind of like isolation among, amongst ourselves is that we, do, we shouldn't share, we shouldn't say hello to all other because there's this, fe this fear like we live in the streets. So I guess I kind of wanted to capture that within my work. I started doing street photography maybe about 10 years ago and it was colour photography, and I was just looking at street scenes. I thought, that's fair enough. It was okay, there were street scenes, it was okay, there's people walking past, but oh, it's a scene. But I realised this wasn't giving me enough. This wasn't giving me enough, it was, felt kind of like, there's no impact, no impact. And I started looking at other street photographers, and I came across a, a photographer, a guy called Daddy-O... A Daddy-O... Well, aye, aye. Aye, a Japanese photographer. And he was before, photographing uh, the streets in Japan since mid 60s until now the, the, the presence and you realised there was just something more you can do with street photography. It's not about the scene, it's not about the kind of like ironic kind of like juxtaposition of an old man walking past an, an advert with a young brooding man 
it's like there's more to it than that. I wanted to get into the, the human details of, of how we feel and how we suffer in the street. And I, I know it's, not, it's, quite, it's quite a bleak observation to make, but there is a very essence of that loneliness that we feel in the streets. And I'm hoping with these images, it kind of highlights that. It, it's like they say that one in four people you walk past the street suffer from mental, like from actual mental health, which I agree with, but it's very hidden and it's something that we can't see. But I'm hoping with these images, I capture that sense of like kind of despair and loneliness. I also think it doesn't help when we're told that throughout the media, for the controls that we have, it's like, yeah, we're, we are very much isolated and we all have a lot of fear. And there's, if you have any questions so far, please, please do ask. Uh, there was a recent incident that's happened to me uh, in the last six months. I was out taking photographs of it in the street and I'm quite close to these people. I'm not doing it from, from afar, I think. Well, the, the, good, the good photography quote is, if, if you're not close enough, it's not good enough. And so I've, I do have a kind of, kind of I'm shooting in a holder, uh, 120 film, where I'm very close to, the, to each person the subject, I'm that far away from them. But recently, six, six months ago, uh, I was stopped by the police in the street. A uh, member of the public uh, raised awareness of my presence in the street. And three police officers approached in the street and uh, the question being my, my motives, and I try to explain to them, I'm just out doing street, uh, street photography, I'm trying to highlight the fear that we live in, the isolation, the kind of like, the, just the, uh, just the, just, uh, it's almost like, uh, so I was trying to explain this to the police officers, but uh, they charged me a breach of the peace and they took away my camera, and in 10 days time I'm up in court because of what I'm trying to highlight, which I find quite ironic because I later discovered that it was a female who made a complaint against me, said I was hiding pine bushes. Uh, there's not many bushes in, 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 in the streets in Glasgow, so where that came from, I don't know. I find it bizarre. So I'm fighting my case, and I've got a lawyer now in charge, and when I spoke to my lawyer about it, he said, in 20 years of practice, he's never heard of anything so bizarre in his life. So I'm kind of hoping I have a wee bit of support and backing over this, because uh, this is my work, and this is what I want to try and highlight in the sense of sight of life. It's, I don't want uh, to kind of give a bad name about Glasgow. I think you could take these photographs in any city in the Western world, to be honest with you. I photograph in a few cities. I've been fortunate enough to do that, and the outcomes are always the same. So it's not a, it's not a critique of Glasgow. I think Glasgow sometimes can be a stereotypical city in the sense that you photograph this, you photograph the kind of poverty and aspects of it, but uh, this is happening in a commercial city, a very commercial city, and it's kind of moving away on from the kind of like, the aspects of Glasgow, it's famous in the 50s and 60s, going to the commercial aspect of Glasgow, and I guess that's, that's my full stop to that.